Welcome back to Ion Radio. I'm John. And I'm Ken. And today we're going to be discussing our upcoming Rebellion in the Rib campaign based in the Clone Wars. That's right. So we're, uh, like our prior two campaigns, we're going to go through uh, Rebellion in the Rim as usual, except as John mentioned, we're doing Clone Wars. So it requires a couple changes to make it work. Uh, and we're going to go through all those changes in today's video. We're also, we, uh, we had a conversation. We were talking back and forth on what we liked about our prior two experiences, what we didn't like. And we've got some new ideas for this campaign, John. Yes, we radically changed things um, <laughs> from past. Spoiler, it became unfun for both of us. And even just watching campaigns progress over conversations with people in person and watching how things go across on different discords and things like that, we both felt that there's something that wasn't wasn't quite right in how the balancing of Rebellion in the Rim went across because when you see that, I would say almost 50%, if not more, of most of the campaigns I've seen started don't actually get finished. I would agree with that. Uh, and it seems like it goes into the first act, you get that first pivotal, and then it falls apart there. Uh, it kind of reminded me of what happens with a lot of the Krullian conflicts. You'd go through two rounds, and then one side was a clear winner, <clears throat> uh, and then that was all there was to it. I think yeah. the other thing, John, that I've noticed in Rebellion in the Rim campaigns is that we tend to see that snowball effect is a little bit slower, but it's in a still there. Of ways, and it's still there. It's you're losing rewards. You're, you're behind on bases. You're behind on strategic tokens. Yes. Um, yeah. So we decided if you've seen our progression of how we fix it, we want it more balanced. Um, one of the things that Ken and I discussed in our last um, wrap up video was that one of the problems was with gaining rewards and the point cost for it would mean that you're just short of what you needed. Like that's what happened to Ken. Like I went in I went to a planet that I specifically needed something on, got like exactly what I wanted. And Ken's like, oh, I would really like that, which I'm one point too expensive for. So then he has to settle for something else that's not as good or really didn't fit his fleet. And then you start getting this point disparity in the game. And Armada does not play well with the point disparity. It plays well when the fleets are very closely tied together in points. And when you're looking at... 200 point fleets going up to 250 fleets, then you're starting, let's say, at 80% and going up to 100%, and your fleet's 20% behind. Mm -hmm. There's no way you're going to win. That's like in a 400 point game, 20% would be what, 80 points? 320 like, point fleet. <laughs> yeah. Like you're, you're not going to beat a 400 point fleet when you're flying 320 points. Like that's a crazy bid. Let me tell you, you get to go first, but or second, um, whatever you want to do. So. Yeah but you don't have enough fighters or ships or anything to like really keep you on the table. You're really playing at a disadvantage. And that could happen after the first round of Rebellion in the Rim as it is right now. Right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go break down the campaign, the different segments of what we've decided to do, tell you what we are doing that is basically normal for Rebellion in the Rim. And just kind of have a general discussion. So hopefully you all enjoy it. Uh, and each section will be uh, chapter mark below. So if you want to come back to it and get to it, uh, that specific part, you'll have it there. Okay, let's get to our first section. I'm going to have Ken read through it, and then we'll both throw our input into it. So here we go. Our first bit is the fleets that we build up. Uh, in this campaign, uh, I'm going to be separatists. John's going to be the Republic. And task force rules in terms of building the ships are going to be the same. Uh, there'll be no custom commander, or we're dropping custom commanders. We'll get to that in a minute. We've got a new system we're excited to share with you guys. Uh, we're going to limit one large ship per fleet. So of the three fleets we're building, only one large in each. Uh, in John's case for the Republic, all the spots are going to be considered unique per fleet. Not per team, but per fleet. Uh, and then in terms of the Rebellion and the Rim rules... So uh, all of it's built around Empire versus Rebels. So we looked at it and decided the best way to make this work is the Separatists will be considered the Rebels and the Empire will be considered, or the Republic rather, will be considered 
uh, the empire. Yes. Um, so one of the reasons why we felt that we could finally um, tackle Clone Wars Rebellion in the Rim is because of Rapid Reinforcements 1. Um, it gave each of the um, two factions, CIS and the Republic, an additional ship. And um, the Republic got a fighter. The CIS didn't, but they're droids, so they, don't, they didn't even notice. It didn't compute. Um, but with that little bit of extra, you could diversify your fleets better. And before only having four ships, very much so limited what type of fleets you could make. Um, but now with five ships, it can be enough variance that each fleet could be unique. Right. When we first talked about this and a lot of people were asking, are you going to do a Clone Wars or Pine in the Rim uh, campaign? We didn't want to have a bunch of fleets that were nothing more than, well, here's five hard cells and uh, two acclimators. And, you know, that was about all really it. There was maybe two different fleet types we could have flown uh, when Clone Wars first came out. And even with that next wave, it just, the, the variety, like John said, was not there. Uh, and I, I agree. Rapid reinforcements fix that. Yeah. Um, we put a limit on how many larges you can have per fleet. And one of the reasons for that is because of the price point of almost all of the large ships in the CS and the GAR. Um, you could fit almost two of any larges into a fleet. And we wanted variety instead of like, here's six Venators on one side. <laughs> Barely any upgrades, but six Venators is still amazingly good. So um, this is mainly for variety and flavor that we're doing it. And then also if you wanted to adapt it to um, the other rules then, or like the other eras, just largest. So Rebels can't be like spamming the same thing. They're really the only ship that can get into it. But um, the other thing, limiting myself for um, the spat and the spat is extremely powerful and we, we almost just banned it outright the same that we normally do with like onagers because of the ignition attack but we felt that it was an integral part of basic fleet designs for um, the Republic as it's standing as like a faction as a whole and it was important enough to add into it but decided to limit it. So then, you know, I couldn't throw like two victories down and two spats because that would get pretty unfun pretty fast. So it's limited once per fleet. So our next section, we're talking about active fleets. So as I've already mentioned, we are running three fleets each. And what we decided to do rather than three battles per round, we're going to have two active fleets. So there'll be two active fleets. We choose those two at the beginning of each round and one will be put in reserve. We're making a point that that reserve fleet cannot be the same for two consecutive rounds. Yes. Um, when Ken and I played our last campaign, so we, we've done a variety of different things. First campaign, we played three fleets each and it was a lot to handle and a lot to record. Um, then the next time we played two fleets and it allowed you then to make like an attack fleet and a defense fleet. And it was like very specific, this is what's gonna happen. And we didn't really like the feel of that either. Um, so Ken for a very long time has been talking about this idea of a fleet gets damaged enough, it gets pulled into reserve. So we went with that. And when we sat down and thought about for recording purposes and for enjoyment of watching, having more fleets in it, would mean that there's a more variety of matchups, which makes it more interesting to watch and more interesting to actually play. And we'll get into more of that in a few minutes with another change that we made, but we want to talk to him about it all, all at once there. But with three fleets in one always out, the pairings will change all the time. And we think that will be better for enjoyment overall in the campaign. And enjoyment for not just you guys at home watching, but for John and myself. Because uh, like he alluded to in the, it was the second one where you had your attack and defense fleet. I knew what I was going to face at the beginning of each round. It didn't matter who had initiative. Uh, this was going to be what it was. And it got old after the second round. And uh, I, this is a better solution. But we did this for more reasons than just because we wanted to have reserve fleet, didn't we, John? Yes. Before we jump 
to that reason, though, let's talk uh, quickly about the fleets that are in reserve. Fleets are in reserve can unscar using bases like normal. So I don't know if that fits better anywhere else, but so we'll have two active fleets fighting while the other one is getting repaired mm-hmm. um, in the background. So it doesn't gain upgrade or experiences or anything like that, but it can repair, which is useful when you have limited bases. So even though we have three fleets, we're only playing it as a two player game. So two bases start. So if you have a whole bunch of droid fighters that get killed off because you can fit so many of them costing seven points, knocking that fleet in reserve to build up your droids again might be pretty useful. So go ahead, Ken. So many with only three hall points. Uh, Limiting it to two, that's... (laughs) Exactly. So go ahead. Uh, Sorry for interrupting. You can... uh, No, that's fine. Actually, that's a great place to put this. So let's move on to our next bit where we talk about commanders. Yes. Another unbalanced point that we've discovered when we played it was the custom commanders. And while it's fun to build a custom commander, um, it really unbalanced the game very, very quickly. Um, And most of the time, the way you earned XP points, I think we both were pretty much done building our commanders after like the first pivotal battle or shortly thereafter. So the rest of it, it was, we just had XP piling up and we weren't going to change anything. Um, And then we were also like, we want to play Clone Wars. And when you think of Clone Wars, you think of major characters. And there's not a lot of unique characters that are units or cards in either fleet right now that aren't commanders. So we had to come up with a method to include commanders. So then, you know, you could have Luminara or Trench or all these known characters that are actually battling in the um, Outer Rim. So we came up with a way to include commanders as the commander for each battle. So I'll kick it back to Ken and he can explain a bit more of that concept. What we opted to do is take all six commanders from both the Separatists and the Republic. And we also uh, looked at this a little bit. So if you want to play Empire and Rebels, you can pull a, you create a pool of commanders that some total is 175 points or less. Fortunately, all the Clone Wars stuff. It has to be six. Yes. Six, yes. So you take your six commanders, and they are unique. So in the case of the Clone Wars, you can't have a Luminara fighter squadron or Plo squadron or a Grievous squadron. So make sure that if you're using Darth Vader, he's not in any of your squadrons or officers because it's unique, right? So that's the first big thing that we had to change. And then what we do is at the beginning of any act, we're going to shuffle all six of the commanders, and you get to randomly draw two of them. Those two then go onto one of your two fleets. That you and you have your three fleets. You select which commander goes onto what fleet, and those will be the fleets that you will use for that round. Then going into the next round, you know, so round two, you take those two commanders off the, and push them off to the side. You shuffle up the remaining four, draw two new ones, and then the two commanders you used in the previous round get pushed back into the commander pool. So you've at this point now used four different commanders, but you don't know what commanders you're going to use, which makes fleet design that much more interesting. Yes. So um, we both have commanders that could be theoretically like dead commanders in if we didn't plan for them ahead of time, specifically TF. The other one is Ular and is hard to play around um, and Plo Koon. Um, so you need to be able to just adapt the fleets. And it kind of has like this cinematic, um, thematic feel to it. Like, you know, Plo Koon has been rushed to the Outer Rim to a certain planet, and he just takes control of the forces that are there to um, fight off evil Dooku who's scheming in the background. You know, it, and this adds to the variety of fleets. So we each have three fleets, and we each have six commanders. So there's a lot of options of what each fleet would look like. Um, what is that? That's 18, right? Uh, yeah, there'd be 18 different matches. Yeah, so there's 18 different perfect. variations of fleets and commanders on both sides. And then those fleets that face each other. So we, we, we might get through the entire campaign without a beer match a single time. And that's kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, and it gives you something to build for in an extra like building mechanic of 
things like that. Like maybe I should have a fleet for actually can, maybe I should have a fleet with B2s on them so I can pass out raid. Otherwise I'm going to get TF and he's going to be hundred percent useless. Mm-hmm. Um, or is there a way that I could be TF and force someone to choose um, raid? There isn't, but um, <laughs> like you, you kind of need to plan that. And then with the fleet that can't stay in reserve, um, maybe my fleet that would be really good with Falcoon is out repairing because it got smacked the turn before. Now he's commanding something that has like two fighters on it and a bunch of ships. But, you know, the clones are important to him. So he's going to try to save those clones, even though his ability does nothing. So it, it gives us a lot of theme of the Clone Wars and desperation and them jumping around and showing up to help key battles when they're sent, well, from my side, when they're sent there by the council, the Jedi council to fight on a planet, or I guess the separatists have like a Senate of some kind. So um, do do dispatches a villain to do his scheming in the background, you know, that's exactly what's happening is it's the scheming that the separatists are doing Mm -hmm. to throw off the Republic. And it, it, while we've been going through this, uh, you know, and thinking forward on how this would work, you could almost hear the narration uh, of each episode uh, at the beginning before we even get the ships to the table. And already when we're at that level of excitement, that's fun. And we think having this randomized commander selection and then really the choice you get is what commander goes on what fleet. And it's great at the beginning of the act where you've got three active fleets you can choose from, but then it comes down to which ship do I put into reserve or fleet do I put into reserve? Now we do make a point that uh, you get to choose that after you know what your commanders are, because yes. that would really stink. Uh, but then that throws in some interesting strategic choices. If you've got two really good fleets with the two commanders you have, you know one of those has to go into reserve. And that, it's kind of a bummer. But again, you get to choose which one's going to be the better option for you or against what your opponent may do. And that kind of makes that fun. Yes. Um, so let's also mention how we handle pivotal battles because i think this is a good like segue right into that sure that's actually great let's go right into pivotal battles then so for our pivotal battles we're going to have all three fleets out in the battle at the same time so it will be somewhere between 600 and um, 750 point battles then and each of them are having a commander so instead of retiring the two commanders from the previous round in drawing three new commanders, what we're doing is um, the pivotal battle is commanded by a, a commander that was in the previous round. So let's say it's round three of act one and we're declaring a pivotal battle. And the round three had Obi-Wan and Plo Koon in it. I choose that Plo Koon is going to lead my forces into the pivotal battle so his and what he's on is stuck. So that's in the battle. Obi-Wan goes into the reserve pile, and then we draw from the last four who the last two commanders in that battle are going to be. And what this does for you is now you get two choices. You get that first choice of here's the two commanders already on a fleet. Which one's driving that charge? And which one can I afford to swap a commander out, hoping I get either a better commander or a commander that you know, will work with that fleet. So there's your first choice. Then your second choice is, here's two new commanders. Which one do I put on which one of those fleets? Sometimes if you have a fleet, for example, built for TF, you're going to put TF on that. But boy, it's not going to be fun when TF is one of the (laughs) commanders you need that you're not drawing, which again, throws into that strategic element. So neither one of us really knows at the beginning of a game, well, right before a, a, a battle occurs, are we actually going to get what we need for that matchup? And it could make something really, really good or really, really bad. And again, that throws into the thematic component part of it. And that's one thing we're finding with this new rule set change that we're creating is the theme is now almost oozing out of uh, this concept. Yes, it is. And then after the pivotal battle, because we're starting a new um, act, All the commanders get shuffled up again, and then we do the random draw from there. So now we've already talked about the commanders. We've talked about pivotal battles. 
but how do we get there? And we've looked at the reward system and we didn't like it. John already told you there were times where I needed one more point to get the upgrade I needed to be useful. So we did like the commander experience gaining system. That was unique, it was interesting, and it created some flavor. So what we did was we took that system and merged it with a reward gaining system that we're more or less going to use for the entire of the campaign. So here's how this works. When you gain your commander experience, it's gonna be very similar. You gain one point for being involved in the battle. If you lose, you will gain a point. If you destroy the enemy flagship, you will get an XP point. And if you win by 100 points or more uh, for margin of victory, you will gain a point. If it's a pivotal battle, we did make adjust that to be 150 points. Yes. We're, limit, we're limiting you to gaining of two, I believe it is, John? Correct. And then what you're going, and we completely ignore understrength. Now, what you're going to do with those upgrade points, so if you have one or two, you get to trade them in for upgrades, and then they'll be based similar to how you know, Rebellion of the Rim is. You, if you win uh, on a planet, or blues, on a planet that has a weapons team and an officer, you can choose to get those. Each experience point will be one upgrade card or one squadron. And if you do a campaign objective, you're limited to one of those being unique. So um, what this really does is it focuses how you play the game. And before, you only needed to win by one point to gain anything in this. And so if we were in a battle and I just sit in the corner, speed zero, forcing you to come to me and kill a TIE fighter and win by eight points, I get full rewards for it. I can purchase on a fighter planet up to 30 points of fighters in one go. Um, you then are stuck with like something silly like 12, so you can't even buy an X-Wing. Um, and then I get victory points for it, and I get the tokens on the planet, which just made like already like um, a negative feedback loop even more negative. So what this allows you to do is allows you to force the other player to play the game. So if you lose, you get the two XP to trade in for the two upgrade cards regardless. But now to win, you want to either win big, so you get the extra, or you need to kill the flagship. And that means then you have a challenge to do. And um, it gives you an objective to do instead of... I'm still going to get all my upgrades and my commander is going to gain points. So I don't really care. I can just sit here and not do anything. You can't really play that way. You, you have to play aggressive and you have to play to destroy the other player. I, I think it really helps push the game in a good direction. I didn't, I'm going to agree with that, John. And it, it puts you in a spot where, yeah, okay, you can sit back. You'll get one upgrade and that's it. And as your opponent now has a, will get two Theoretically, their fleet size is going to be bigger. It's now going to be harder for you to win in the second round. So you really kind of have to get in there and go after the flagship. Because generally speaking, the bulk of the points are going to be in the flagship, but not always. Yes. And you're forced to blow something up, which is what you want to do in Armada is see ships blow up. Exactly. Um, the wording that we used for gaining the XP is specific. In case you're in a pivotal battle that gives you rewards, you get one XP for your entire group for each flagship killed. You get one XP for your entire group for each or for the 150 points in the pivotal battle that you win by. Your fleet individually gets one point for participating and your fleet individually gets one point for losing. So let's say if we were in a pivotal battle and I didn't win by 150 points, and I only killed one of your flagships, my fleets would each get one XP, and then I would choose a fleet to get that one XP from the flagship killed. That's it. So the second player would have a benefit from there. So if I really wanted to do something in a pivotal, I have to hunt down all your flagships. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? We'll, we'll find out uh, during the course of this if John does do that, hunt down some flagships. Uh, it'll be an interesting game, John, where the only thing that happens is you go in in a pivotal 
and just target the three flagships and leave everything else. <laughs> everything else is left alone. That would be pretty funny. That would be funny. So um, also taking into faction specific things, um, the Republic has no ion slots. No. And when we examined the planets as a whole, um, we discovered, I believe there were nine ion planets or something crazy like that. Something like that. Yeah. And it was like, or it was like seven ion planets, four to five turbo. And then there's only three ordinance planets overall. Yeah, it was something like that. It might have been nine turbo laser. I forget. But in either case, there was an, a disproportionate number that didn't sit well with us. Might work fine for galactic civil war factions, but not so much with Clone Wars. So we redistributed that. So uh, Ken will probably pop up a slide um, and it'll list all the planets that changed. And it's really just to give a little bit of variance so then the GAR player isn't stuck fighting over and over again for planets that have ion that they literally can't get any reward for. So what we've done, uh, we've added turbo laser rewards to the following planets. So Mygito and Raxus Prime now have a turbo laser slot as one of the rewards. And then we also added ordnance rewards to these systems, Geonosis, Hoth, Raxus Prime, Ring of Kafreen, and mm -hmm. Seleucamide. So what this kind of does is it adds the ability where, uh, as John said, if you're Gar, you're at a planet that only has ion, for example, Raxus Prime. You kind of need to, you're, you're not going to get anything out of it because you have no ships to equip a, a uh, an ion reward to but if you could throw in an ordnance or a turbo laser and this might be a benefit to separatist ships as well depending on how you're building your fleet so now you've kind of added some reason to have a fight at like six different systems now john correct um it just diversifies the planet types a little bit better and really ken and i's idea when we went into this is we didn't want it to be difficult to build your fleet and the distribution of specifically everything being ion made it difficult for one player or both of us to progress forward. And we didn't want, we didn't want that. Um, that's kind of all of our changes are against that. So that's why we went ahead and uh, made those changes. So let's talk about some scoring things that we did in prior campaigns and how that's going to impact here. Because I think it's important to bring this up as well. We've talked about margin of victory already. Uh, we're still going to use the tournament tabling rule. So if everything but uh, a flotilla is destroyed in terms of ships, the game's over at the end of the round. Uh, so in this case, the only person that could be tabled is me because I'm the separatist. I'm the only one with the flotilla. Uh, but you will gain... Uh, whatever the fleet point value is of that fleet uh, automatically, whether you destroyed everything or not. Uh, we are putting a minimum of 200 points on this, so you're guaranteed to get at least 200. And then, of course, if you get objective points, those will get thrown in there. The other rule that we're going to play with is half points gained for crippling a ship. So this is kind of what you get with the Superstar Destroyer. You get half the hull destroyed, or I think the specific language is a number of damage cards equal to half the hall rounded up. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case anyone wants to really look into the rules, right? Um, you'll gain half points for it. And what that does is make it that much more difficult to hit that 100 point margin of victory, uh, which is again, something if you are losing, if you can just destroy one of those ships or one more fighter, you're, you're risking it a little bit but then you're potentially denying getting that last damage card to clip right. a ship into it. So it's not just largest. It's not just huge. It's every single ship is treated as half points um, this way. And this is something that we talked about after our first campaign, mm -hmm. we implemented, I believe half points on larges in our second. I think you're right. And then we decided just to go, why bother? Let's just do it all in and this. And that, that also makes like targeting the flagships even more important. Mm -hmm. um, because if you beat up my ships and I beat up your ships and we just win, the margin of victory is going to be very, very, very small if everyone's getting half points on everything, especially when you're looking at just 200 points. Mm -hmm. 
And again, that makes it more interesting. It makes it more fun. And that's what we want out of this campaign is it has to be fun to play and you guys have to enjoy watching it. We made a couple other interesting choices and changes to some of the strategic tokens because we're going through our rewards, mm -hmm. you know, with how we get our rewards and everything else decided we need to tweak some of the strategic tokens. So some of these we did in our last campaign, we're going to keep those. So first one is skilled spacer where we have an additional effect where effectively you get a, a one-time use veteran ability uh, for one of your ships and or squadrons. Yes, it's keeping the original effect as well that you can add an additional veteran at the end of the round. But um, we felt like sometimes you would just have a stack of them and all your ships would be either veteran or not veteran. Like being able to have a way to just spend them out would be for an actual effect would be very useful. The second token that we made a change to, and we did this again last campaign, is spy net token. Uh, where during your deployment, you can use, spend a spy net token for that fleet to pass one of your deployments during the deployment phase. Uh, you can't do it twice in a row, so similar to the pass token. But specifically for deployment. Right. So it's just another way how to use it. And uh, I don't think we ever really used it, but Maybe the option is there. <laughs> Now, here's the token, though, uh, that John and I spent a lot of time really looking into, and that's the ally token. Uh, John, this was kind of a lot of your brainchild, so yes. do you want to talk on this one? Uh, sure. So when we were, we've already mentioned it, I've already mentioned this, that um, Armada really breaks down when there's a huge point difference. And the ally token just adds, what was it, 40 points, 45? It was something points. high. Um, 45 points on top of your current fleet. And that's insane. It's just insane. Especially like in our last campaign, I already had more points than you. So then some of the games I was playing, I almost had a hundred points over you. That's not, that wasn't fun for me. It wasn't fun for you. And it probably wasn't super fun to watch. You should still go watch it. It was still fun to watch. <laughs> um, but like the points, it's just too much. And like bringing like 45 points of perfectly um, done squadrons into the battle was really, really broken. And I would, I mean, I took full advantage of it. I'm not going to lie. Um, but like certain, let's choose it. I could force you on a planet to play an objective that I wanted to play. And I would then take strategic squadrons with it because you didn't have any. And guess what? We're going to play fire lanes now. Well, you're going to lose. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it was broken. So we scrapped pretty much the entire thing of that. And we changed it to be a single fighter and the fighter specific for the two planets. So the two planets, if I'm not mistaken, are Mandalore. Mm -hmm. And Nel Hutta? Is it yep. Nel Hutta or Nel Shadar? It, it's it's Nel Hutta. Nel Hutta um, that give you ally tokens. So depending on which one of those you hold depends on what type of ally. Like what? Who would have thought? So it's if you are dramatic. <laughs> yeah. So if you are in control of Mandalore, you will have a Mandalorian gauntlet fighter single mm -hmm. that you can add to your fleet for the token. And we thought thought that was kind of a fair trade-off. That's 20 points. It's still a big help. But that's it. It's also another way that uh, Gar, if they took it over, could get Raid into a fleet for TF. So we thought that was a good idea. Um, and then the other planet um, is because it's a smuggling planet, you could then get um, a YT-2400. And so that's 18 points. So it's either 18 points or 20 points. Um, I actually think the YT-2400 um, is a better fighter, even though it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, but the gauntlet fighter might help specific fleets and if you control both planets you get a pick but if you only control one then you just get the token for that planet so if i control mandalore and ken controls um now Hutta, you know what the other player is going to be bringing because that's the only option um if you lose control of it and still somehow have an ally token then because you've clearly kept records it is whatever the last ally place that you have was that you would get that for and it's not going to break the game and i think before the ally tokens broke the game it was like my number one priority to maintain control of all the ally tokens 
because I was already playing fighter fleets and here's 40 plus points of fighters on top of it is crazy. It's just, it's just there are decimators, a whole bunch of, I think you could fit three fire sprays in there. Um, yes. There were some neat options that were deadly. I, I think my, a lot of times it was, I will bring an interceptor or like two, cause it has to be irregular. So mm -hmm. it was like, here's a jump master and two Lambda shuttles and they can move anywhere they want. And I'll control tokens and relay through them or, or something dumb. Like it was dumb, but we've now very limited their power level on it and assigned specifically what it is even for the specific planets that it's assigned to. Again, for that theme of the Clone Wars, like this is why they were fighting over the Separatist planet of Mandalore or the neutral planet of Mandalore because they needed that, that gauntlet fighter for TF. So like, like if, you, if you have a fleet, you can like push it that direction with the ally token. And this, again, it oozes oh. theme. And that's where the fun of what we're doing really sits we also had to take a look at all the objective cards and there was so many references to irregular squadrons so we again sat down and really looked at each one and made some kind of unique decisions uh, that we felt worked well both in a semblance of game balance and theme so there were four well yeah four uh, campaign cards objective cards that got impacted First one being hired scum, and it's scum. What should we use for this? We decided two fire spray 31s uh, would be a good scum faction type uh, fighter squadron to throw in. For prototype recovery, we're going to use a single VT-49. You do not get the crit effect bonus though. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Otherwise it's like three damage. Yeah. So um, the reason why we did that is theoretically it would be in development for the Empire at this time. So why not just make it the prototype? And by itself, it's pretty good, mm -hmm. but not the best. But we just axed the, um, the bonus crit damage and allowed the fighter to be more expensive than what was listed on the card. And we hope that works. So if you guys try this out, let us know. The other objective card that came out uh, that needed a, something to be tweaked was Recruit Allies. What we're doing here is one small base ship, no upgrades. Yeah. Um, it's the same problem that we ran into with um, the Empire for even like the Allied token, really. And you get like one single choice that fits into the points in verse like the rebel which almost all their small ships bases can fit into that so the rebel player obviously has more choices so just limiting it to a small base no um no upgrades for the republic is you can bring a pelta or you can bring one of the cr 70 variants and for the um um cis you'll bring a hard sell or a gazanti but it'll be a hard sell yeah, um <laughs> but you don't have any upgrades on it and then the final one that we took a look at was one of the base defense objective cards, specifically Fighter Wing. So this one, John, as I recall, it took us a while to figure out what we felt was somewhat balanced. And what we ultimately arrived to was for the Separatists, you get five Vulture Squadrons. And for the Republic, you will get three V-19s. Yes. Um, we went back and forth. We really wanted to make like this mixed Fighter Squadron that was... Uh, sitting there and every time we did it the points wouldn't land properly mm -hmm. and it didn't balance very well so we're hoping that this is a fine balance point um we basically just looked at the hall value of each of the fighters as a whole to determine this so you both gained 15 points of hall for the fighter squadrons with this and we decided that would probably be the best way to um, make it even. So that's the bulk of what we wanted to talk about for the campaign. But there's a whole bunch of little extra one-offs that really don't fit very well into one section or the other. So let's go through that list. I'm just going to run them off real quick. And then, John, you can chime in with why we may have done that. Uh, so first one's going to be no base attacks on the first round. 
Yeah. Um, reason for that is we would like the campaign to progress forward without it being cruel. <laughs> as much fun as it would be to lose all my bases, Hunter one, right? So the other thing that we wanted to do, and this goes into fleet building and how we're doing commanders. Commanders will count as zero points, just like they do for your custom commanders in terms of margin of victory and victory conditions. Just makes sense to kind of do it that way. Yeah, the bonus for killing a flagship is the bonus experience for killing the flagship. Right. Uh, as usual, fleet building, maximum of two ace squadrons or uh, squad unique squadrons with defense tokens. Uh, and then that's just because we're playing up to 250 points. Yep. Um, also to throw in there, you have to designate your flagship and it can't change. Same as with the basic rebellion in the rim. So whatever the commander is, it always gets applied to the same flagship. Well, that's a good point. We forgot to bring that one up. Uh, but another item that we should talk about is conditions. Because uh, one thing that we noticed in the prior campaign was if you got a condition and then you had a choice of which one of, you know, another condition, you can only have one. It's like, well, I'm going to take the one or keep the one that's better for me as opposed to not. So when you gain a condition, you can't gain a condition if you already have a condition. Right. So not that I exploited it one bit whatsoever, but... <laughs> um, I would just go and I got a condition and then I just kept it the whole game because the other conditions were worse and then I never had to worry about them. So instead this time you collect conditions regardless. And at the start of the battle, like obviously before you deploy your opponent gets to decide which conditions in effect for that battle. Right. So you kind of have a little bit of control over your opponent's misfortune, if you will. Uh, and now you have more reason to get rid of one or all of your conditions because, again, your opponent gets to make that decision instead of you. Correct. Uh, we're still playing like we did in the last campaign with unique base defenses. So the first three bases that are built, uh, which include our starting two, will all have a different base defense. And this way we're not doing, I think it's the planetary ion cannon one. Uh, yeah, it's by popular. far the best. Or the fighter. A uh, fighter one now might be cool with our with our loadouts, uh, but you're required to for the first three. It's got to be unique across those. The next set of three, it'll be unique across there. And if we get you know 16 bases, that'll be repeated for the sixth time. Yes. Uh, scarred squadrons. This is one that we came up with last time because there was a, a way around this. Uh, when you deploy your squadron and it's scarred, you lose a haul, but then you just land it on the station and get your haul back. You can't do that. Correct. So now that if a ship is scarred or a squadron is scarred, it's permanently reduced by one so that um, you can't heal it up on the station immediately and be back to fine. Um, this is just so then you have to unscar those squadrons. And then the final thing uh, that we did use in the last campaign we're going to continue to use is the requirement for a climactic battle. So at the end of an act, if we're at four campaign points, uh, you trigger the pivotal. If your team is six or more campaign points behind, and this is total for the entire campaign, you have to play the climactic battle. If you're at five, you can then choose it. Yes. This makes it so then if there's already a clear winner, it doesn't just drag on indefinitely. Well, it hasn't, but playing an extra full round when it's kind of over becomes too much. Yeah. Um, one additional one is all objectives are treated yeah. as unique for building fleets. This is the one that I think we've used since the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And it just adds variety to the games. So then you're not stuck playing the same set of objectives on every fleet. So you won't come across surprise attack, contested outposts, and solar corona on every single one of my fleets. One of them might have that, not going <laughs> to lie. But you'll see a variety of objectives. And it just goes into um, any time that you're playing a campaign and you're going to be playing the same fleet multiple, multiple times in a row. And for us, we're playing multiple fleets multiple times in a row. 
Um, the same reason why we're having a reserve fleet is for variety. And this gives each of our fleets variety. So on each side, we have nine unique um, objectives. Plus the campaign ones, depending on the location you're at. So yes. we may never play the same objective twice. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of covers everything that we have and decided to make changes to or developments for our Rebellion of the Rim campaign. Uh, we're definitely very curious to see what you guys think, and we're really excited to play this. Uh, I think the one thing that uh, John and I kind of talked about once and we thought was funny, there does exist the possibility for one of the commanders and maybe two to just never see <laughs> uh, a single <laughs> battle. Uh, so we're, we're hoping that doesn't happen. It could, though. Yes, and if it is, hopefully it's you, Lauren, um, <laughs> because I think it's going to be a real challenge to get my money's worth out of spending the tokens to get an additional squadron in um, a 250-point game. No, I'd agree. I think it'd be difficult to do it uh, in a 400-point game. Uh, with you, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that pretty much sums up all the rules that we threw out there. We might have forgotten one, but we'll be covering it in our future videos. So we're going to bring uh, another video real soon. We're going to talk about our fleets, the opening up of our campaign, so what planets we select, uh, and then we'll get right into the campaign proper shortly thereafter. Uh, so I know you guys are excited to see what we're putting to the table. You're excited to see our commanders in action. Uh, John, you and I are excited to bring this to everybody. Yes, yes, we are. We're interested in hearing what you guys think of our rule changes. So just drop us a comment or come talk to us on our Discord about that. We'll be making an entire new um, discussion thread specifically for this campaign like we have in our previous. All right. Thanks again for watching, everyone. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Check us out on all the socials. And until next time, I'm Ken. I'm John. This is Ion Radio. So now that goes through quite a bit of what we wanted to do for the campaign. There are a couple other extras that really you're going to start meowing now. Go away.